With big surf like that, I'm sure you'll agree that today's the perfect day to talk about functional medicine, integrative nutrition, and low-dose naltrexone. So let's have that conversation. All right, well, thank you, Jill, for joining us today. For everyone in the audience, uh, Jill Carnahan is a medical doctor practicing functional medicine in Boulder, Colorado, and she's agreed to chat with us for a few minutes on the therapy called LDN or low-dose naltrexone. So, Dr. Carnahan, thank you for joining us, and if you can give us a little bit of insight into the clinical use and application of LDN or low-dose naltrexone, I think we'd all appreciate that. Sure. Thank you so much for having me, Dr. Vasquez. So, um, basically, the naltrexone as a drug was first um, researched in the 70s for a anti-addiction medication, and that was used at the high dose, either 50 to 100 milligrams. So it wasn't until more recently that the low dose and the application of that came along. Basically, it's an, a blocker of opioid receptors. And so there's a opioid growth factor receptor that the naltrexone displaces where the endorphins are bound. Now, what we found over the years is Dr. Bahari did research in the 80s and actually mid 80s with uh, HIV patients and found some incredible benefits because what he would find is these patients that were immunocompromised um, and then later with autoimmune disease, things like fibromyalgia and um, autoimmune, other types of autoimmune disease, these patients would have very low endorphin. And what he found is he was researching the best way to get um, a minimal blockade effect that would actually induce the body to produce opioids naturally and increase endorphin levels. So it's actually opposite of the mechanism of action. It displaces and decreases um, receptor um, binding but then on the other end, the next 20 hours after you take a low dose of this drug, you will get an increase in up to 300% or three times the normal production of endorphins. And the endorphins half-life is about 20 hours. So um, what you want with the low dose naltrexone is a very short acting. That's actually real important with your pharmacy. Um, so you get that quick blockade for just a couple hours, and then you induce the body to make the endorphins naturally at a higher level for the following day. So again, it started out as a as a uh, anti drug campaign um, uh, issue, and then now it's become more of a use for the autoimmune diseases and the things where you actually have the low endorphin. That's very interesting. So, if I understand you correctly, it's blocking the receptor, leading to a compensatory endogenous increased production. Exactly. And, and so then people end up with more endorphins. Can you speak to the the clinical benefit of that? So. I think generally, yes. when we think of endorphins, you know, everybody's going to think of runner's high, for example, because it's always associated with runner's high. But, for example, are, do people just feel better, less depression, less pain, or are other benefits uh, noted as well, maybe like an anti-inflammatory effect or something that's immunomodulating? Yes, yeah, so there's some pretty profound benefits. So, first of all, like I said, a lot of these disorders where it's used, which we'll talk about specifically in a few minutes, um, there is already a low endorphin level if we'd actually measure, which is hard to do. We don't typically in clinical practice measure metakephalin or beta endorphins. And you're right. The interesting thing about exercise is that that's what this is compared to because we know that typical um, aerobic but not uh, weightlifting, so just aerobic, they did a study with HIV patients. They had a uh, part of the arm was just aerobic exercise, and the other arm was uh, weightlifting and bodybuilding, and only the aerobic arm showed an increase in beta endorphins. So there's a direct link with exercise, and this is basically like a natural way, not really natural because it's a drug, but it's a very physiological way to increase the body's endorphins. Now, what else endorphins does is fascinating, because they did a study with cells in a Petri dish, so it was outside of the immune system, and they wanted to see, does endorphins have an act um, in and of itself on cancer cells, or does it work in conjunction with the immune system? And in that particular study, again, it was cells in a Petri dish, not in humans. But what they found was that uh, meta and keflin added to the cells dramatically increased the die-off rate of those cancer cells. So there's this direct effect on cancer, which is one of the applications that's being studied for lotus naltrexone um, on the, the cancer cells themselves. Now, there's other effects on increasing natural killer cells and, and macrophages. And as you can imagine, in both of our realms of uh, patient interaction, a lot of these patients have low-grade chronic inflammatory conditions because of occult infections and, and hidden types of things like that. 
And of course, we know with autoimmunity and molecular mimicry, often there's a component of other infections. So this actually enhances the body's ability to fight off infections through the um, production of increased macrophages and natural killer cells. Very interesting. And I also appreciate that, that you mentioned the, the study in the HIV patients with regard to exercise showing that aerobic increased uh, endorphins, but weightlifting didn't. Because one of the mechanisms that's often thought for induction of endorphins is pain. But my hypothesis for a long time has been that it's actually uh, systemic alkalinization due to physiologic uh, alkalosis, secondary to respiratory alkalosis. So anyway, that's a bit of an aside, but I think it's consistent. So with regard to increasing, perhaps, I mean, I think that when we, when we think of the immune system being increased or decreased, I think that's kind of a simplistic and, and erroneous way to look at it. But in, 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 my, in my question, I want to ask, if we're going to say that maybe endorphins stimulate the immune system a little bit, uh, would we expect to see that some patients might have a flare of their disease? Is that possible? Or have, has that ever been noted? Or is that something that, that maybe doesn't happen here? You know, that's a great point, because with the um, conversations that you'll see among patients on their groups and things, so, so this is not clinical studies, but with their conversations, especially in MS, they will often talk about they get worse before they get better. And it's a very short term, like within 30 days or so, uh, maybe 60, but they do sometimes see an actual change, a slight worsening um, before they get better. And again, that's just... Um, talk on the internet. It's not a randomized sure. trial, but it's interesting because I, I think that is a piece of the puzzle of how this actually acts. And you mentioned mood too. See, that's been just a side effect. We don't really use it to treat mood, but a side effect is these people feel great. They feel happy. They feel full of energy. They feel as we would expect with increased endorphins. So that's that's been a side effect. We're not really using it to treat depression or mood disorders, but the side effect is um, uh, improvement in mood and energy as well. Sure. Let's see. So basically, if I'm understanding your, your presentation of this, maybe we could say that it's kind of a, a little bit of an immune stimulant, maybe a little bit of an immune modulator, and probably has some immune stimulate or sorry, mood elevating and maybe, uh, as we would expect, analgesic effects. Because a lot of these patients, especially, uh, well, with all the conditions, but I was going to say, especially yeah. with arthritis, they often, of course, have pain. Yes, and they have actually done specific studies in complex regional pain syndrome and uh, fibromyalgia both and have a pretty dramatic decrease in pain, as you'd expect. Sure. Very interesting. Uh, I'll have to look into that. Well, I don't have to, but I want to look into that more. I'm, as you know, I've been doing a lot of work lately, and I just finished a book last night on an update on uh, fibromyalgia. So I'm definitely into that material. Let's see. So when would you use this in your own practice? Uh, and obviously that would vary per patient and per situation. But, you know, generally speaking, as, as you and I were discussing before we started the recording, like I've got kind of a tiered protocol. And I think we're in agreement generally about that, uh, about yeah. that approach. But, for example, would you use this kind of right out of the gate or would you wait a little while before you use it? So great question. Um, and first of all, before I jump into that, I just want to mention that the published studies right now have um, uh, been published on Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, irritable bowel syndrome, and, and SIBO. Now, that's a whole other side issue, and I want to mention it right now so I don't forget. Um, this, as you can imagine, opioids slow gut motility. So if someone has a motility like a migrating motor complex issue and it's predisposing them to develop small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, this is a phenomenal drug. And again, this is a totally different indication, but I will use it as a motility agent in SIBO to prevent recurrence if someone has motility issues. Because as you can imagine, blocking opioids um, for a short period of time can actually enhance motility of the bowel. So that irritable bowel as an indication, I think is more related to the small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, which we know overlaps. Um, other published studies would be multiple sclerosis, fibromyalgia, complex regional pain syndrome, and even cancer, like especially ovarian cancer has been the one I've seen most in the literature. Patient reported, there's a bunch of other indications, and um, this would be ankylosing spondylitis, Epstein-Barr syndrome, or viral syndromes, hep hepatitis C, lung cancer, RA, or rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, Parkinson's, um, and then uh, lots of patients in reporting inflammatory bowel disease, although there are published studies on that. Now, as far as when to use this um, in clinical practice, I definitely don't usually start people right off the gate the first visit. 
So I'm usually addressing, you know, uh, like we talked about basics, diet and lifestyle and some of those things first. And then as we progress, um, I will, uh, especially with autoimmunity and with cancer patients, I will offer them this as an option and tell them, you know, this is off label. I guess I should make that clear as well. Um, naltrexone is indic indicated for opioid de dependence. And of course, we can legally write for these prescriptions off label, but these are all off label indications. And I feel very comfortable doing that. Um, but it would usually be probably second tier or third tier when I add this in. Okay. All of that makes good sense. And how do you apply it clinically? Like what doses do you use? Uh, do, yeah. Is it dosed, for example, per condition, per severity, per body weight, per age, things like that? Oh, and yes. sorry, let me ask one more question about the doses. Uh, do you have to make any changes for hepatic or renal compromise? You know, high doses over 100 milligrams were shown in some studies to elevate liver enzymes. I have never seen it with the low doses we use in naltrexone. And I'm pretty chronically monitoring labs on these types of patients. So like I said, and that's in the literature as well, there's really no issue with liver at the lower doses. So low dose, so what does that mean? Dr. Bahari kind of set this up for us in the 80s with his aged patients because he did some really good studies um, with what he could afford on I think 50 to 100 patients at a time. And what he did was he was trying to figure out what's the, what he found is that those higher doses, people would feel terrible because they would have total blockade of the opioids. And as you can imagine, it has the opposite effect when it's blocking. So at 25, 50, 100 milligrams, it had no effect on the immune system. It just blocked opioids. So what his point was, was he was trying to find out what is the smallest dose for the shortest period of time that we can do to actually induce the body's natural response. And what he found is doses between 1.5 to 4.5 milligrams were optimal. And 3.0 was actually kind of the standard. It's not really dosed according to weight. It's dosed more according to sensitivity and side effects. In my clinical practice, I will prescribe a 3.0 tab that's um, scorable and then have them start with one half, so 1.5. Now, timing is important because your opiate production um, inherently is optimized at 2 to 4 a.m. And so what patients do is take this right before bed and then uh, hoping that it will actually block that 2 to 4 a.m. spike. And then the next day, they will wake up and have increased production of endorphins. And this literally can happen on the first dose. So although you, over a few weeks, will notice some improvement, and like we talked about earlier, you could have a flare initially, potentially, um, you, will, you may notice right away some effects. So like I said, I use a scored um, immediate release. That's important as well. You do not want a sustained release or long acting because you're wanting a very short blockade. And then I'll start them at uh, 1.5 milligrams for a week to 10 days. If they tolerate that, um, then I'll move them up to three. And if people do really well on the 3.0, we'll go to 4.5 milligrams. So I try to get to the 4.5 if they tolerate it, but anywhere between three and 4.5. And you can just compound it exactly um, how you want it. You want, to, you want the pharmacy used to use the ready tabs or the tabs that are uh, quick file available. Um, and you can even have patients dissolve them under their tongue if you want them, you know, immediate release. And side effects, I, I guess we'll go into that as well because this is important. So when patients start, what would you tell them? Well, I usually say the only things I've seen as far as side effects with this is because you're blocking opioids and opioids make you sleepy and, and you know deep sleep and all of that right before bed, there are some people who can have some insomnia. Now, what I find is when I start with the 1.5 milligram tabs, if it is insomnia mild, it improves over a week or two and then they can go up in dose. So over time, the side effects of insomnia or um, the other one is vivid dreams or nightmares, and that's been pretty rare as well. But those things usually over time will abate. Um, I have a few patients who can't go higher than 1.5 milligrams, and then I just leave them at that dose because we know the lower the dose that's effective, that's perfectly appropriate. But most of my patients are on 3.0 or 4.5 milligrams at bedtime. The other thing I've done is even though this is less than ideal physiological, I'll move it up in the evening. So I'll say try it at 5 p.m. or try it at noon. I have two patients who take it at 9 a.m. So again, it's not exactly physiologic, but it seems to work. They've had some improvement and they have no effects on sleep that way. So you could potentially dose it at different times of the day if needed. And I also mentioned SIBO or, or small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. For that indication, which isn't really an immune issue necessarily, it's more the motility issue. Sometimes I will dose them at 1.5 to 3 milligrams twice a day so that they get that bowel motility effect more frequently. Sure. Now that makes complete sense. Uh had one quick question since we're on number five here about contraindications and potential side effects. Yeah. 
would you would you feel a need to warn a patient, for example, who maybe has a history of of bipolar or mania to to start with a, a lower dose, or would would you feel like that might be a contraindication? That's a great point. Um, that really isn't discussed in the literature, but I completely agree with you. We're thinking along the same lines. I would be more cautious. Um, interestingly enough, you would think like pregnancy and breastfeeding were contraindications. I didn't mention this in treatment, but there's several docs that are using this very successfully for infertility. So as we can imagine, there's autoimmune components in fertility, and I'm suspecting that's the mechanism of how this works with the autoimmunity. Um, and they are using, uh, there's, there's one doctor that used regularly 50 milligrams in pregnancy, the higher doses, because with PCOS and some of those things, it's actually excess endorphins, and they, they actually suppress the endorphins and get success. Um, and he has had no issues, no complications, and, and feels like it's quite safe. I still have not used it in pregnancy, and I'm not sure that I would. But again, it's out there that it can be used. Um, like I said, the higher doses, <clears throat> excuse me, liver enzymes have been proposed as an issue. I've never seen that at the lower doses. So really, other than insomnia, um, potentially anxiety, insomnia, or vivid dreams or nightmares, those are the things I usually talk to patients about. And I've really not had any other issues. Uh, it sounds all that sounds good. LDN strikes me as a little bit of a paradox in that it's it's somewhat immune stimulatory, but also somewhat anti-inflammatory. Apparently, just like for example, melatonin has the same effect. Yeah. It's kind of a peripheral. At least I think of it, and I I just reviewed and wrote about this recently. It's kind of a peripheral immunostimulant, but then like in the central nervous system, it's actually anti-inflammatory for reducing glial activation, et cetera. So it looks like you know we see a little bit of that here. Also related to, uh, you mentioned a little bit of, I think, insomnia with the uh, low-dose naltrexone. Did I understand you correctly in that? Yes, yes, um, and that's fairly common. And usually, like I said, it wears off. Um, but if someone has trouble, we'll move it up in dose or we'll just stay at the lower doses. Would, would you ever use melatonin to offset that effect or have you ever have you ever done that? Oh, you know what? Yes, because a lot of people are on melatonin before they start LDN or, you know, we add it in after for sleep. I think there's no contraindication sure. on that at all. Okay. Well, I, I'm, I'm happy to hear. I, I like melatonin quite a bit. and I, I use it as kind of a foundation in a lot of my, my protocols. It's shown benefit for fibromyalgia, some of the conditions that you mentioned, fibromyalgia, hypertension, uh, obviously insomnia. So. Well, yeah, and you know what's interesting, Alex, is, is I just started reading about oxytocin and its immune modulating effect. We know it as, you know, of course, bonding and with autistic patients, some patients, some doctors are using it. Whole nother thing, but I think all of these kind of new um, cutting edge potentials are, are affecting the hypothalamic pituitary axis and some of these immune modulating effects way up, you know, high in the in the in the brain. And that, that would be melatonin as well. So it's fascinating to me because I think as we get more research out on LDN and melatonin and oxytocin and how we can actually use these things to modulate immune function is, is incredible. Sure. And I, I think what you said right there, the way that you said it is really important to the, the modulation of the immune system, you know, like the, the, the sophomoric viewpoint is, you know, immune, sy immune system is either stimulated or it's low, but that's really not the case. It can be stimulated and low at the same time. That's quite clearly what we see in patients with rheumatoid arthritis, for example. They're immune deficient and Kind of hyper immune yes. at the same time. So yes. obviously, I think immunomodulation is definitely the word. So yeah, interesting, Alex. One thing I was thinking about, I did not see this in the literature. This is just my own supposition, but I suspect that we know TH17 can be dramatically upregulated um, in autoimmune disease and the Treg cells are downregulated. And I think this probably has, and again, that would be one of those things where you have this overactive, um, you know, TH1 part of the immune system and uh, autoimmunity is developing. And I think that there's a potential here that this actually modulates increasing Treg cells. That would, that would make sense to me. I don't know that that's true, but I'm suspecting as we get more information, we might see some of that on the sides, the, the arms, the immune system of which it modulates. I had heard something to that effect as well. So I, I agree that'll be an interesting uh, development to monitor. So let's see, do we, I think we've covered everything. We've covered the basic definition mechanism of action, clinical applications. You discussed many, many applications there. Usually you said second or third tier, uh, how it's used. You discussed the doses. We talked about contraindications, potential side effects. Any final comments or conclusions? Um, I've just found this to be incredibly safe. And, and I would say um, eight or nine out of 10 patients have no problems and no reactions and do really well. 
Um, it's not something dramatic that you're going to see when you start it, like within 30 days, oh my gosh, their MS is gone. It's one of those things that just subtly over time adds to your, um, your patient's improvement. Sure. But it's profound, and I, I'm a really big fan. Well, I, I appreciate your review of, of that topic, and I also appreciate how you just kind of contextualize it, how it's not it's not the answer, but it can be a useful part of an overall plan. I, yeah. I think about that. You know, the other day, for example, I was working with a patient, uh, both in two patients, rather similar, uh, pretty aggressive psoriasis and rheumatoid arthritis. And as I was reviewing my own plan with these patients, I was thinking to myself, you know, each component of this plan looks almost insignificant, you know, like I've got, yes. some, I've got some coenzyme Q10 here, some lipoic acid, acetylcarnitine, clean up the diet, vitamin D. I mean, none of those are major by themselves, but synergistically there it's, I mean, I, I get better results than the clinical trials using, you know, uh, bi so-called biologic or I would call antibiologic drugs. So, you know, I think that's, that's something that uh, gives our, integrative functional medicine approach and advantage. Each component is safe and mild in itself, but the synergistic efficacy is just at times stunning. Yes. Yes, I totally agree with you. Thank you, Jill, for sharing your expertise with us this morning on this topic. I know that a lot of a lot of your followers, a lot of a lot of our members and, and followers at ICHNFM will also be interested in this topic. So I look forward to uh, sharing this information uh, with our mutual audiences. And again, very much appreciate your expertise on this topic. Thanks so much for having me. Enjoyed our discussion. Thank you.